Amen. It is so great to be back home. Elena and I missed all of you very, very, very much. And uh, yet it was an extraordinary time with the brothers and sisters in London. And uh, then after we were in London with the gathering and spending time with Michael and Michelle, uh, we went to the Kernans, with the Kernans, Tim and Leanne Kernan, to Paris. And uh, we went there just to spy out the land. And uh, they, they fell in love with Paris. They've agreed to go. And so when the Williamsons come, uh, are gathered at the Jubilee to send out the mission team, then the Kernans will come back to Los Angeles, and they'll be training here, and hopefully in a year or two then, we'll be sending out the parish mission team. Amen, guys? So God is really moving in a great way. As is my custom, I try to read through the Bible every year, and uh, so I, I, I got up to the book of Galatians this week. And uh, I, was, I was reading Galatians, and then there was one particular verse that, that really hit me. It's the verse that I memorized as a baby Christian, and it's Galatians 2.20. It says, Paul's writing, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me, and gave himself for me. Well, it's kind of interesting because, and, and for some of the older people in the crowd, you'll understand what I'm saying. Uh, when it comes to music, you remember all the songs word for word, like when you heard them as a kid. Amen? Any Beatles song, I'll give you all the words. Beach Boys, I got it nailed. Even Herman's Hermits, I can get those nailed on down right there. And this, this, particular, this particular verse here in Galatians 2.20 was a song that was sung in the campus ministry that I was converted in. And, and, and I was trying to remember it, and I don't know if I got it totally, but I was sitting there in my quiet time trying to get the song going there a little bit. And, and it, it really touched me, and it really moved me. I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ who liveth in me. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I, I go, you know, when it, when, it, when, it comes, when it comes down to it, that's the Christian life. And so the title of the lesson today is Crucified with Christ. So then I started thinking of all the scriptures to go along with it. And of course, the number one discipleship scripture is Luke 9, 23. So I felt that I'd be an awesome first point. So then I started thinking to myself, and if you ever had a memory scripture you just remembered, but you didn't quite remember? And so I was thinking to myself, you know, I said, Jesus called and you got to take up the cross daily. And I started going in my mind, I go, did Jesus say to take up his cross, to take up the cross, to take up your cross? I, was, I go, you know what I bet is? I said, I bet it's take up the cross because we all have the same commitment. Amen, church? Well, let's look what the scripture says. Let's go to Luke 9. Jesus said in verse 23, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet to lose or forfeit his very self? If anyone's ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Wow. First point. Take up your cross. Right here, the Bible just lays it out. The very words of Jesus. He says, here's the bottom line. If anyone wants to call himself a Christian, if anyone wants to be a disciple, first of all, you got to deny yourself and take up your cross. The cross representative of both pain, suffering, and death. And the Bible says the call to this commitment is daily. He says, that's what it takes to follow me. And he goes on. He says, 
If you want to save your life, you got to lose it. You got to give it up voluntarily. He says, but the bottom line, got to reason this on out. What good is it if a man gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? And then he gives the acid test about whether or not we're really followers of Christ. When he says, if anyone's ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, the glory of the Father and the holy angels. He says, if you're afraid to stand up for Jesus Christ, you are not a disciple. Say what you will. Talk about the morality of your lifestyle. But if you are ashamed of Jesus down here, he's going to be ashamed of you at judgment up there. You know, the Bible teaches that in order to be baptized, you have to make the decision to be a disciple. And this is a very challenging verse in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Jesus says, what? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Wow. So the only individuals that can be baptized biblically are individuals that have been made into disciples. Now here's the teaching of the scriptures. The scriptures teach that we, as disciples, are to make disciples, and then they are baptized, and that's where God saves them. Are you with me right here? That's the challenge we have. Is as disciples, we are to go out, not just share our faith, but to make disciples. And then they are baptized to have their sins forgiven, Acts 2, 38. You know, it occurs to me there are a couple challenges that we need to be mindful of as a congregation. First of all, it's come to my attention that, sadly, there, there have been many deaths that many of us have been close to or have been in our families or friends and it's a very interesting thing about when someone dies that's very close to you and they're not a disciple. Is that sometimes there can come into our heart a sentimentality and a fuzziness of thinking about who is saved and who is lost. The Bible says, listen, the only people that can call themselves followers of Jesus are disciples who have been baptized for the remission of sins. Those are the only saved people. That's what the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches we're going to be judged by the word of God, so God's not going to change his mind up there. Why is that so important for us as disciples? Because our purpose is to seek and save the lost. And if we're fuzzy on who is saved and who is lost, we're not going to be about the Father's business in seeking and saving the lost. Are you with me right here? And so we need to be sure about that. If there, there is a death in our family, if somebody's very sick, that should cause us not to doubt the doctrine or to become fuzzy about who is saved and who is lost. It should make us all the more urgent about getting the truth out there because we don't have all the time in the world. Are you with me here, church? Amen. Secondly, it occurs to me that some of us in the congregation have begun to back off our evangelism. We're not having as many visitors come on out to services as we had just a month ago. Some of our Bible talks have very few attending. But you know, it gave me great joy when I got a text message while I was over in uh, Paris from Ken Zindler. He says, bro, we just had a great Bible talk tonight. We had 17 visitors at our singles Bible talk. I was going, that is awesome. So I text back, how did you do it? He says, well, Josh Corlick brought 12 of the visitors. He said, but I did bring two. I did bring two. Amen. I mean, that's, that's exciting. And we're all encouraged by that. But sometimes we don't relate to that Bible talk as much as a new Bible talk that we also started in the West region that's being led by Sasha and Nick. They had their first meeting two weeks ago. They met at the Cursor's home. They had their first meeting two weeks ago, and they had no visitors. That's not really exciting for disciples. So what did they do? They talked about it. They prayed about it. And they determined that each of them was going to have to work. In one week's time, 
this past week, they had six visitors at their Bible talk. Is that awesome? Amen, church? And you've got to really ask yourself, as a disciple, am I ashamed of Jesus? Am I really living the life of a disciple, or have I backed off from my purpose? See, bottom line, you got to take up your cross. And you know, for some people, the cross is different for others. For some people, it is their evangelism. For other people, it's self-denial and really dealing with lustful thoughts or impure thoughts. For other people, it's the challenge of the finances in this time of recession. And that's why we need to understand that the commitment that each of us is called to is the same. And yet the cross we carry varies. Because the cross says, in the area that you most do not want to surrender, you must surrender that to God. There must be a voluntary, total surrender in order to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen, church? So that was point one. Take up your cross. Point two. Don't drop the cross. But you will. Jesus did. Turn to Mark chapter 15. You know this passage well. Beginning in verse 15. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium. And called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him. They twist together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing on his way in from the country. And they forced him to carry the cross. Wow, I mean, look at, look at all that Jesus has been through right here. We see that he's been flogged. We find that he is just made fun of by having a twisted crown of thorns put on his head. Then they mock him being a king by putting a purple robe on him. And then they strike him with staffs again and again, and they spit on him. He endures all of this before he's led off to be crucified. Well, he doesn't get very far, and Jesus physically just can't do it. He drops to the ground. And seemingly randomly, but we know the Lord is never random, amen, guys? They pull this man from the crowd, a man named Simon. And they put on Simon, Jesus' cross. Now, was this an issue of a lack of spiritual strength? I think not. Jesus had been in the garden, and the Bible says that he was sweating drops of blood. And he came out of that prayer, totally surrendered to do the will of God, as an angel was strengthening him. Amen, guys? So his spiritual strength was there, but sometimes even Jesus was just so exhausted by the moment, he couldn't go any further. He couldn't carry the cross unless a brother came to help him carry his cross. See, sometimes we get so super spiritual in our Christianity, we think, oh, it's just me and God, just me and God. Let me tell you something. Sometimes you need a brother to carry the cross. Do you have that kind of brother in your life? You know, one of the crosses I think that sometimes we have to bear in the body of Christ, particularly as we're sending off mission teams, is changing relationships, particularly changing discipling partners. And for some people, it wounds them spiritually, and they feel the personal hurt of being torn away from a close relationship instead of seeing what this sacrifice is doing to further the kingdom of God around the world. Well, Jesus' closest brothers were away. They had, they had fallen away. And here was a guy he didn't know, Simon, 
who came into Jesus' life and carries the cross. Now, how's that for a new brother? Amen, guys? But what was the blessing for Simon? Well, it's very interesting. Turn over to Romans chapter 16. At the end of the book of Romans, Paul usually does give greetings to different brothers and sisters at the place that he's sending the letter to. And in verse 13, he says, addressing the entire church at Rome, Greet Rufus, chosen the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Now go back to your text. Verse 21, Mark 15, it says, A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Wow! Simon becomes a disciple. And his two boys, Alexander and Rufus, become leaders. And later on, Simon's wife becomes a spiritual mom to the apostle Paul. Is that flat awesome or not? See, that's spiritual family when you're willing to take up each other's crosses. And see, taking up somebody else's cross, you already got one cross, your own. Now you're taking on another cross. But that's just what it takes if we're going to get each other to heaven. Are you with me right here? Don't drop the cross, but you will. Jesus did. I think it's the longest point I've ever had in this sermon. You know, there's another guy that dropped the cross. You may know him. Peter. Turn to Luke, chapter 22. Beginning of verse 31, this is at the Last Supper. Look how Jesus talks to Peter. He says in verse 31, Simon, Simon. Well, that's his old life. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I pray for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go to you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Wow, what an intense interaction there at the Last Supper. Jesus predicts Peter's falling away. He says, Satan's asked to sift you as wheat, and he is going to, and you are going to fail. He says, never, Lord, I'm with you to the end. He says, even before this night is out, you'll disown me three times, and then the rooster will crow. And we know that happened. You know, I bet at that night, Peter's mind was flooded with a lot of thoughts and memories. On special occasions, we, we always remember the good times. I bet that night, Peter remembered back to Luke chapter 5. And one of the most powerful interactions he ever had with the Lord. Jesus has just finished up a lesson. And we read in verse 4. When Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out in the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Lord, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they'd done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. I mean, can you imagine this scene from the shore? When Simon Peter saw this, he felt Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished to catch a fish they'd taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Do you think Peter ever forgot that day? The day he'd been fishing all night, hadn't caught anything... And Jesus says, go out in the deep and then put down your nets. He says, nothing's going to happen, Jesus. I've been fishing all night. He says, but because you say so. And sometimes we do things just because the Bible says so. Amen, church? When Peter put down that net, whoa, all those fish come on in. He's signaling his partners on shore, come on, we need some help. They were reeling in the nets. The nets were breaking. Both boats were so full of fish. They're beginning to sink. And that dawns on Peter. Wow. I am in the presence 
of God in the flesh. And he just humbles out. He says, just, just, just go away from me, Lord. I, I'm a sinful man. And Jesus says, listen, don't be afraid. I've got a plan for your life. No longer are you going to be messing around with these stinking nets and fish. But now you're going to catch men. And the Bible says all of them pulled their nets up on shore, left everything, the boats and the nets. Amen, guys? Because that's what it takes to be a disciple. And they followed Jesus. But here we are about three years later at the Last Supper. And shortly after that time, he denies the Lord three times. Well, let's go to after the resurrection. Go to John chapter 21. And we find a situation that's eerily the same. Peter has totally dropped the cross right here. Jesus is resurrected from the dead, and yet we read this in verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, or the twin, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. He said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got in a boat, and that night they caught nothing. Does that remind you of a situation in the past? But what have they done? Even after the resurrection, Peter had gone back to the boats and the nets. He experienced the same emptiness as before he met the Lord. He caught nothing. Let's read on. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Nah, they answered. He said, throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. That's as opposed to left. Not right versus wrong. Amen, guys? When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John. That's how he refers to himself, the disciple Jesus loved. (laughs) Then the disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he'd taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. She said to them, bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even so many, the nets weren't torn. She said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Wow, there are a lot of parallels in the two passages, but it's very interesting, this second time, the nets were not torn. It was very precise. Peter, remember, man, after catching nothing, we had 153 huge fish. And if you're a fisherman, you count every fish. You know what I'm talking about? And they knew that day the Lord had moved. Well, they ate a little bit, and we read in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Now, you can tell Jesus is now having a serious D time with Peter right here. And don't you appreciate the fact that Jesus waited until after they'd finished eating? So next time you go to D time, just go, bro, just go ahead and finish your food and then we'll be able to talk. (laughs) He finishes eating and notice Jesus calls him Simon again. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. She said, feed my lambs. Again, she said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. She said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. She said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went to where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Wow, he's trying to get Peter restored right here. Amen, guys? Now, first of all, we understand that Jesus asked him three times, 
do you love me? And of course, that was to burn indelibly upon Peter's mind. The fact that he had denied the Lord three times. But the passage carries even greater impact if you know just a little tiny bit of Greek. There are basically three Greek words for love. One is eros, sexual love. Phileo, which is friendship, friend love. And the other is agape, a self-sacrificing love. Now let's go through the passage and let's break it down that way. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly agape me? Do you, do you have a total self-sacrificing love? More than these, of course, he's pointing to the boats and the nets. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I phileo you. I'm your friend. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly agape me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I'm your friend. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you even phileo me? Are you even my friend? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you phileo me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. Feed my sheep. You know, sometimes when we drop the cross, we mistake, quote, having a friendship with Jesus for having a total self-sacrificing love for Jesus. And Jesus is not content with just being buddies with you. Jesus wants everything. Jesus wants you to give up everything you have, everything you've dreamed, everything you are, and give it to him in a total self-sacrificing way. Are you with me here, church? It's very interesting. That next passage right there. He says, Peter, when you were young, you dressed yourself and you went where you want. He says, when you're old, someone else is going to dress you and take you where you do not want to go. He was talking about the cross. And he says, follow me. You know, it's a pretty widely held belief that the tradition about the death of Paul and Peter was true. They both died at the hand of the Romans in about 67 A.D., Paul was beheaded because he was a Roman citizen. Quick, fast. But not Peter. It's said that Peter and his wife were taken before judgment. And Peter was challenged. If you renounce Christ, your wife will be spared. And tradition holds it. She says, don't try to save me. I'm already saved. And Peter is forced to watch his wife crucified. And then when it came his turn to be marched across, he said, listen, I'm not good enough to be crucified like my Lord and like my wife. You crucify me upside down. That was not just a statement of humility. It was a statement about what the Christians were doing to the world. They were willing to die to turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ. I really want to ask all of us this morning, have you dropped the cross? Oh, you will. I mean, Jesus did. But have you dropped it? And you're willing to let someone help you with the cross? You know, being in London brought back a flood of memories for Elena and myself. See, we were in London just two years ago at the first gathering. This was the third gathering. Just two years ago was gathering number one. And Tim and Leanne were like so fired up to be there because there were 17 others. In other words, there were 19 of them who said, listen, we want to start a new church of sold out disciples in London, England. And we were there. The place was on fire. They were so excited. And then Tim preached Sunday after Sunday, midweek after midweek, 
Bible talk after Bible talk about what it really meant to be a sold-out disciple. And I'll never forget a phone call in February, just six months later. He says, bro, there's only six of us left. He says, I, I just feel like quitting. I feel like a failure. I don't think I can go on. And I said, bro, listen, now you've got what God wants you to have. You finally have a base of only sold out disciples. You just need to simply keep believing Jesus' plan that disciples who are sold out make disciples who are sold out, who make disciples that are sold out, and they will multiply. A year and a half later, we're there, and exciting things have happened. In the previous six weeks to our arrival at the Gathering Three, just a year and a half later, after they only had six, that group had had eight baptisms in the previous six weeks. Is that awesome? Three of them were at the conference, and by that Sunday, they had 31 sold-out disciples. And they just had another campus baptism today. Does that fire you on up or not? I mean, God is really working. Do you really believe that Jesus calls us to be totally sold out, totally surrendered to the cross of Christ. If you've dropped your cross, be humble enough to let someone carry it for you. Amen, church? Our third point is stay on the cross. Go to Matthew chapter 27. You're familiar with the passage. Beginning in verse 39. Those who passed by hurled insults at Jesus, shaking their heads, saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Wow. Here are the taunts of the people. Jesus, come down from the cross and save yourself. Don't you think that it crossed Jesus' mind to do exactly that? To come down from the cross and then hurl a few thunderbolts in those guys' directions? But Jesus knew that in order to save them, he had to lose his life. He had to be totally surrendered to the point of death. These are just not idealistic teachings. These are the teachings of God. Do we believe these teachings? Are we willing to stay on the cross? I believe one of the great challenges for modern disciples to stay on the cross is finances. Let's look at how our first century brothers and sisters handled things. Turn to Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, we remember in verse 41, the beginning of the church when 3,000 people were baptized. Was that awesome or not? Well, look at the kind of fellowship they had. Verse 44 and 45. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Wow, that's, that's incredible. A lot of people say, well, why were they doing this? Well, it's quite simple. We understand that many of the Jews had come to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Pentecost and only planned to stay a week. But then when they became disciples, they knew they needed to stick around and get strong in the church fellowship. Are you with me right here? To get the apostles' teaching, to get the fellowship, and to have that time of communion with one another before they went back to their home nations. And so to take care of these unexpected visitors, what did they do? Well, they shared everything they had, and they sold their possessions. You know, it was really cool. One of the converts that uh, I, I had a chance to meet was a guy named John Attaway. He had been a, a Baptist preacher for years. He was 69 years old, and he'd retired. And he was taught the way of God more accurately. And he got baptized as a disciple. 
Here's a 69-year-old guy finally finding the truth. And he was so fired up. He was so fired up that he sort of saw how poor our London church was. They says, okay, I'm going to give you my Mercedes. Now, what he was doing with the Mercedes is a whole other story. But nonetheless, he gave up his Mercedes, amen, for the sake of the church. He was sacrificing his possessions so the church could forcefully advance, amen? You know, right now, we have people that have unexpectedly dropped in on us, like Sasha and Louisa. And then they're, they're here by the Spirit. I hope you believe that. And they never expected to be in Los Angeles for a while. And we didn't expect them to be here either with our financial planning. But you know, sometimes God's plans stuff that we don't. And say, that's going to cost us a little something. So what? We've already given everything to the Lord. We want to share all we have with our brothers and sisters that join us. Are you with me here, church? Turn to Acts chapter 4. In Acts 4, we see the spirit of the New Testament church even more. In verse 34, there was no needy person amongst them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Wow. Now they're selling some of their land. They're selling houses, and they put the money at the apostles' feet. Now, that's, that's a sign of trust. You know, back in the first century, there was just as much distrust as leaders in the 21st century, guys. And these people are saying, listen, we know you guys are apostles. We know you're not perfect. We know you guys dropped the cross. But we know that you're back on the cross. And we trust you to spend our money for the Lord. Verse 36. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. It's kind of interesting. Did a little study on this. Clement, who was supposedly a second bishop of Rome, said that, Joseph, or later called Barnabas, was one of the 72 that Jesus had commissioned in Luke 10. You remember that? And very interesting, if you you look at this, there's a slight mistranslation in the uh, International Version. Barnabas is a very simple name to break down. Bar means son of, okay? So Simon Bar-Jonah is Simon, son of John. So Bar, son of, Nabas. Well, that comes from the Hebrew word Nabi. N-A-B-I, which means prophet. So he was a, a son of a prophet. He was a son of exhortation. He was a preacher. That's who he was. But I'm sure son of encouragement applies because they appreciate the land that he gave to him. And right here we see that he gave some of the land. You know, very interestingly, when we were in London, we had a great remnant group come on in from Kiev, Ukraine. And the leader of the group is not a full-time minister, nor has he ever been. His name is Wova, and his wife's name is Natasha. Awesome couple. And uh, we're talking about, there's there's another very powerful uh, Russian couple that wants to join our movement. And yet here in the LA church, I mean, to say we don't have money, that's an understatement. And I, and I told Wolva, I says, is there any money in the Kiev church to support this couple? They really want to join us. And he says, well, the church doesn't have any money, but Natasha and I do. I said, well, what can you do? He says, well, we'll pray about it, but we'll sell some of our land. He's, he's a real estate developer. I said, wow, that's awesome. I mean, isn't it awesome when you see the Bible lived out in the present day, guys? I mean, we've got brothers and sisters in remnant groups that are selling land. They believe in what we're doing so much. Well, you know, the challenge to stay on the cross in the area of finances got a lot tougher as the years went on for the first century church. Let's go to the book of Revelation. In Revelation 12, you're familiar with the passage where Michael and his angels battle with Satan and his angels in the heavens, and Michael and his angels beat Satan. Amen? But they're cast down to where? The earth. And so Satan and his angels, and and demons are just angels that are 
bad angels. <laughs> They're in control of the earth. And so we read this in verse 17, chapter 12. Then the dragon, that's Satan, was enraged at the woman, that's the Jewish nation, and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments, and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Those are disciples. Amen, guys? So Satan is at war with us. Then you see this ominous verse 1, chapter 13. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. That's the vision that the apostle John's getting. Can you, you see this vision? You see Satan, the dragon, looking out into the sea. Whenever you're looking out in the sea, you're expecting something, aren't you? Let's read on. And I saw a beast come out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and each had, and each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. Now, 42 months is just simply... A number that we understand is a multiple of three and a half. Perfect is seven. So imperfect, or the time that evil is allowed to range, is three and a half. So 42 months is three and a half years. So peace is given, a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies, and to exercise this authority for 42 months, the length of time evil was to reign. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All those whose names have not been written in the book of life belong to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone wants to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone wants to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. And the church said, wow, this just sounds intense, even if you don't know what it's about. You got Satan waiting on the shore. And he's looking out for something to happen. And out of the ocean comes the beast. I mean, that's intense. Now, we understand the beast from the symbolism right here to be representative of the Roman emperor. And it's very interesting is that the tradition had been held that through the years, after the emperor died, he was deified. And thus he was worshipped as a god. Well, the most notorious of all the Roman emperors, in his hate of the Christians, of the disciples, was Nero. He was the one that set fire to Rome in 64 AD and blamed the Christians, your brothers and sisters. And they were crucified. Not only were they crucified... But they were also used as lamps. They would pour oil on the Christians, and they would light the Christians, and they would take them while they were still alive and use them as lamps to go through the garden and to show his garden. Their children were fed as they watched to the wild dogs in the arena. These people were challenged. Do you love the Lord? Willing to give up everything. And so you notice in the passage... The notation says that one of the heads seemingly had a fatal wound, but it was healed. Well, the first beast represents Nero. The second beast that lives again is a later emperor named Domitian, who was the worst persecutor of the disciples. And yet, different than all the emperors before him, who were then deified after they died, he says, I don't want that after I die. I want it now. Everybody in this empire needs to call me Lord and God. Now that put the disciples in quite a challenge. And so, as the Roman emperor 
He had power and authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. And the inhabitants of the earth were called to worship the beast. He says, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Amen. Well, let's read on. Look what happens. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. Oh, my goodness. Now, we won't get into all the details right here. This is the false prophet. So now we've got revealed to us the unholy trinity. You got Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. Wow. Verse 12. He exercised all authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. There were false miracles in the false religions. Verse 14. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so they could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Get this now. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it's man's number. His number is six, six, six. Wow. Right here, we see there's a financial impact to those that do not have the mark of the beast on their forehead or on their right hand. Where does this come from? Well, back in the first century, masters had their slaves stamped with a mark, much like we stamp cattle. Soldiers punctured their skin to show which general they served under. There was that much loyalty. One of the most famous episodes was one of the most wicked persecutors of the Jews in second century BC, Antiochus Epiphanes, branded the Jews with an ivy leaf that was the symbol of the god of drunkenness, Bacchus. And so right here, to the first century ears, they fully understand the mark of the beast meant he owned you. He owned your intellect, the mark of the beast on the forehead. He owned your work of service, the mark of the beast on your right hand. And so what is this about? Well, I think we can figure it out quite simply. Notice a little hint right here. It says in verse 17, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. For us, that doesn't make very much sense. For us, for people back in the first century, it made a lot of sense. There's a study, it's called Gematria, which is the study of numbers in names. So, for example, when Pompeii was dug up back from the first century explosion, one of the houses had this graffiti on it. I love her whose number is 545. That's not a phone number. <laughs> That's what her name, if you add up the numeric value of the letters, came out to. And so what is this 666? Well, of course, the beast is, first of all, Nero, or they called him Nero Caesar. The Hebrews called him Neron Kaiser. How do you spell Neron Kaiser? N-R-O-N, Neron, Kaiser, Q-S-R. When you add up the numeric value of those letters, none, the N is 50, Resh, the R, is 200. Wa, the O, is 6. Nun, is 50, that's Neron. Then add Qua, the Q, 100. Samak, Sissi, and Resh, 200. You get the number 666. Very interesting, in one of the text variants to this passage, the mark of the beast isn't 666, but 616. Why? Because sometimes 
for the Jews, they would spell Neron as simply Nero. They would drop the N, which is worth 50, and of course, then what would be the numeric value of the name? 616. Isn't that powerful right there? And so right here, what was, what was going on? Well, there were places in the empire, because the empire covered many, many, many nations, where you had to have a slip of paper where the emperor's stamp was pushed on it so that you could buy and trade. Now, in order to get the emperor's stamp on your paper, you had to be willing to say about Domitian, as he commanded, you are Lord and God. He says, but the disciples, the true disciples, those that refused to drop the cross, they could not receive the mark of the beast. And when they didn't receive the mark of the beast, it impacted them severely, financially. They literally lost everything because they could not buy and sell. So what happened? The disciples that had money took care of them. Amen. Amen? Just like at the beginning of the church, just like the most intense times here at the end of the first century, needs to be the times that we live in here in the 21st century. Amen? You know, finances still are a challenge for us where we are tempted to compromise. I was talking to one sister this week. I said, well, how's it going? She goes, well, it's, it's, it's been a little tough. Overall, pretty good, but it's a little tough. I, 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 have, I have my rent money, but I don't have all the money for my pledge. And what needed to be said was, hey, you have all the money for your pledge. You don't have all the money for your rent. And I challenge her, you need to work some more hours. You need to make it happen with the right priorities. We need to be faithful with our weekly pledge, church. And overall, we've been doing a much better job about it. I really want to commend you. But still, there are some of us that have misprioritized and don't have our first fruits to give to God. And so you, to some degree, wear the mark of the beast. You have compromised to worship your landlord, the state, more than the Lord Jesus. November 22nd, we have our four times missions contribution. Now, is that because the church was derelictal? Nope. The Holy Spirit brought us some unexpected gifts. Now, we have a choice right here. We can say, hey, you guys stay in Moscow. You guys, Jamba Shai, you, you stay over there in Nashville. Just die spiritually. Or you say, listen, come. We'll take you in. We're in America. We have plenty. Now, sometimes we don't feel that way. But we, we got to get our attitude right here, guys. There are many unexpected things the Spirit brought upon the first century church. And they were told to welcome even persecution with joy. How much more unexpected brothers and sisters that are with us. This four-time contribution, I really want to challenge us. Do more than that. It's really cool. One of the brothers who's had a little bit of a tough time uh, in finances, Big Mo, who was just restored a couple of months ago, he was so fired up this morning. He says, bro, bro, I got it. What's that? I got my special. And he gave it to me. He says, you better keep it. <laughs> it's sealed. <laughs> he says, but I'm going to try to get some more, bro. I got my four time. I'm going to get some more. Amen. See, that's the spirit. He's excited about it because he believes in what we're doing. Are you with me right here, guys? Yeah. You know, on the 29th, we're going to have a financial meeting at 4 o'clock. Meeting of the body. We all need to be back from Thanksgiving. At that time, we're going to be challenged to up our weekly pledge 10 to 20%. Amen. Now, there are some disciples, you've been around for years, and you are maxed out. Amen. If you're maxed out, amen, bro. Amen, sis. But there's some 
that still have more to give, particularly baby Christians. Prayerfully, you believe in what's going on here more than you ever have. There are people that sacrificed everything to bring the mission team down here. And your baptism was because of their sacrifice. Now, your sacrifice means the baptism of more people. And so I really want to challenge all the baby Christians, and there shouldn't be any more baby Christians amongst us because we're almost done with first principles, aren't we? And now it's on to maturity. And as a mature person, now you've got to take over some of the responsibility that's going on in the family here. So no more baby Christians, okay? You're becoming mature. Maybe you're kind of a teenager now. I don't know. But I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you people that have been restored. Very often when you're restored, you still come into the, into the church week. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, that's where, where Mo was at. I mean, it was really tough. But I see him getting stronger. And I, you should have seen the joy that Big Mo had today in giving his missions contribution early. He's just so fired up. So we want to challenge you guys that are restored. Give more because you believe more and you're stronger now because brothers and sisters have helped you bear your cross. You know, the question, bottom line, comes why? Well, because we believe in the evangelization of the nations in this generation. You know, brothers and sisters have been around a long time. They know that we had a very challenging plan called the Evangelization Proclamation in the 90s. Let me tell you something. The Crown of Thorn Project dwarfs it. This is really intense and challenging because of the expanse that we're trying to achieve. Going around the world in the major cities, already in America. I mean, isn't it amazing? Already in America, we're in the four most influential cities by anybody's account, New York, L.A., Chicago, D.C. I mean, that's amazing, amen? And it's going to be awesome seeing the Mejias go on out and lead the church there in D.C. Along with Jack and Jeannie, an office is going to go with them. Is that awesome or not? And he was just restored a couple of months ago. He goes, Carlos goes, bro, you want to go? He goes, amen, bro, whatever the need is. See, he believes. You know, in Honolulu, we've asked C.L. Salamanca, our, our dear sister from Portland, to go to Tallinn to help out with the work there in Tallinn, Estonia. But we don't want to weaken the church there in Honolulu because it's a church planting. And so we've asked one of our sisters, Ashley Godwin, to go to Honolulu. Amen, guys? And prayerfully, she'll be an intern pretty soon. I know, Honolulu isn't quite the challenge in some of the other places, but amen, she's willing to go. Amen, church? You know what's incredible? With these six people, in the past two and a half years, we will have sent out 47 disciples. You know how people planted this church? 42. In two and a half years, we've sent out more disciples than came down here in the first place. That is incredible. That's incredible about what's happening. And think about it from a world perspective. Already, the Lord is moving in our pillar church down in South America in Santiago with the Sullivans. I mean, it was so great to know that Yelena was taken care of when she went into the hospital down there by Helen and Melina. I mean, I'm, I'm so excited about the Williamsons taking the mission team at the Jubilee in 2010. Amen, guys? It's going to be great. And, and already we have people asking me, we have a sister from Syracuse that wants to go. She's a PhD in medieval studies whose father was born in the UK and had a UK passport. And so she can get a UK passport just like that. She wants to be on the mission team, giving up her teaching position at a local college there. I mean, these are the kind of people the Lord is drawing on. And it is, I don't know about you, it's starting to get really exciting right here. Going to Paris. I mean, Paris was just amazing. I mean, being down there in the Latin Quarter where the Sorbonne is at, I mean, the, the throngs of students is my point. The University of Paris, on all of its collective campuses, there are a quarter of a million college students. And those college students hold keys not just for Paris, 
France, Europe, but for so much of Africa and so many places in the Middle East because Paris is a hub of influence for there. It doesn't really seem possible, but when Carlos and Lucy take off to take over D.C., the Smellies, Andrew and Patrick, are going to be moving here January 1, amen? And they're going to be pulling together the Johannesburg mission team. I mean, this is incredible what's happening. Here, city before us, are Sasha and Lisa ready for Moscow, and others want to join them. I mean, don't you see it happening? What price can you put on a single soul? Let alone the hope of redemption for a lost world. I put before you, the cause before us is a noble one. It's going to take gallant hearts. It's going to take first century-like disciples who take up their cross, may drop it, but we're going to let a brother help us. And then when we get the cross back, we're going to stay on the cross no matter the opposition, no matter the challenge, no matter the cost, until we die to see the world evangelized in our day. Thank you, and God bless.